Hello and welcome to Crushing Comics. It's one of those special days that I have a box full of air from America, but also books from America. This box has 14 books totaling 20 pounds. Let's see how quickly I can talk to you about 14 books. This was my end of December, beginning of January order from our pals at In Stock Trades. Oh my goodness. Let's see what's in here. Okay, so the first book in here is Pure Nostalgia. It is the Dark Horse Heroes Omnibus. I never knew that these are kind of like small sized. I mean, compare this to a standard sized TB, uh, TBB. That's kind of small. It's interesting. I've never seen one before. So this was a series of one-shot issues in the 90s where Dark Horse was trying to establish their own superhero universe. And so they kind of did pilot episodes, but they were in groups of four that were in similar city neighborhoods. And then the ones that were the most popular wound up becoming ongoing series. I think Ghost ultimately was probably the one that was really uh, the one that broke out the most. And also X and Barbed Wire. So I actually looked for these digitally and they're not available. And I just thought it would be fun in retrospect to like go back and read them all because I had a lot of them as singles but not all of them. So I found this on sale and I was like, heck, let's get it. Next up, oh, this is a cool one. So this is Black Panther, Panther's Quest. This is really interesting because Black Panther had an ongoing serialized story in Marvel Comics Presents from issues 13 to 37. And that was like the predominant place that Black Panther was appearing in the late 80s. And there wasn't a lot of Black Panther in the 80s or 90s. And this was by Don McGregor, who had written him for a really long time and illustrated by Gene Cullen, who is, one, as we've heard, one of my all-time favorites. So really cool for this to get collected. I always love when Marvel collects a bunch of stuff from Marvel Comics Presents. And um, this makes a fantastic addition to my Black Panther shelf. This is like one of these weird ball collections that I just like can never help but buy. It's called Avengers Tales to Astonish and it just has three weird mid-90s one-shots. Tales to Astonish one, Strange Tales one, and Tales of Suspense one. So they were bringing back all the titles of the classic Marvel anthology series from the 60s. And it just was all like a number of one-shot adventures of Avengers. And they were, the cool thing about them was that they were all fully painted interiors. So the interior work, especially for the 90s, is pretty spectacular. And I actually have some of these in single issues, but like rather than try to figure out like where to bind them or something, like why not just pick up a relatively cheap new trade paperback? Let's see. This is the second trade paperback of They're Not Like Us. They're Not Like Us is a image creator-owned series actually by the publisher of Image, Eric Stevenson. And uh, the first one... Speaking of any series I love, Bitch Planet! This is actually Bitch Planet triple feature book one. So because Bitch Planet comes out so slowly, uh, as written by Kelly Sue DeConnick and drawn by, oh, I forget the artist's name, who I really love, that's a shame. I don't know if I have it handy. Um, this, uh, this is actually like a anthology book that shows some other stories from the world. Valentine Delandro is the name of that artist. That shows some other stories from the world of Bitch Planet by some awesome other creators. So I'm super excited for that. I think Bitch Planet is a work of genius. I wish they could be releasing it a little bit faster and we could get a little bit more of the story a little bit quickly, but this is a really fun way to fill the world. And I think it's a great way for an established comic book writer like Kelly Sue DeConnick to highlight up and coming writers and artists in the field. This next one is Kim and Kim, Love is a Battlefield. It is by Magdalene Visaggio, an amazing art. If this is the same team as the first one, Eva Cabrera and colorist Claudia Aguirre, um, I just was obsessed from the, the art and the first one. So this book, it's like um, these two intergalactic sort of fixer, bounty hunter, sometimes rock and roller ladies, like, uh, you know, kind of like two hand solos in one Millennium Falcon. The first series was really funny, really charming, uh, and the artwork was beautiful, beautiful, especially for like an indie series from Black Mask, who's a really small publisher, and so I'm really excited to read more. Mags Visaggio is one of my favorite new voices in comics. I love how she hits you quickly with sci-fi concepts, but they're grounded in the human 
characters. I get really annoyed when it's just like sci-fi concept, sci-fi concept, like a sort of like a Morrison or even uh, a Milligan without like a really good grounding in the character in the middle. And Kim and Kim's first volume had that, so I'm excited to read more. Back to Kelly Sue DeConnick, who we were just talking about with Witch Planet. This is the second volume of her series with Emma Rios, Pretty Deadly. Pretty Deadly is like set in sort of an alternate fiction historical universe of the of the Wild West. It's a really strange and beautiful comic book. I found the first one actually like really kind of challenging to read. And so, um, but I love Kelly Sue DeConnick and I love Emma Rios. So I said, you know what, if we're going to be reading more indie series in 2018, let's get the second volume so I can read them both and maybe have a greater understanding of what's going on in that world. Wow, this, there's a lot of books in this box. Oh, this series is adorable. Brave Chef Brianna. I read this uh, with my daughter. It's super, super cute. It's ka from Kaboom, which is like the little kids imprint of Boom Studios. And it's um, this, the youngest daughter of a culinary um, dynasty. All of her older siblings are boys. They all have gone off and like did their own cool restauranting thing and she's like, what am I going to do? So in order to make herself really stand out, she decides that she's going to go to a city of monsters and be the one human chef with human food in that city of monsters. But human food is not popular and sometimes illegal in the city of monsters. And so brave chef Brianna has to be very, very brave to uh, figure out how to serve that populace and prove that she's just as good at cooking as her brothers. And it had awesome recipes in the back, which are reproduced here, which I'm really excited to make. Next one is volume number two of Gem and the Holograms. This is by Kelly Sue DeConnick with amazing artwork from, who is it? Actually, a couple different artists on this one. Emma Vicelli. Uh, Corin Hallwell and A.B. Meberson, and then even more artists. So this has got a lot of different issues in it. Uh, seven issues, seven to ten, the outrageous annual and the holiday special. And this, I love Jen as a kid. I went as Halloween, uh, as Jen for Halloween one year. I had a Jen bike. She was my favorite. So I started reading the first one with my daughter. I think it skews a little older. It seems like a good series that would be for like an 8 to 12 or 13 year old that's a little bit more into that like kind of social friction part of their childhood with like mean girls and clicks and stuff like that. But it's also got a really cool cast of characters, all girls, all women, uh, forming their own band. So that's really cool too. I started reading the first one. I really loved it. Kelly Thompson is by far one of my favorite art, uh, writers in comics right now. So I said, you know, with each order, I'm just going to throw another one in until I wind up with them all on my bookshelf. And that's how we got another book of gem. Has that been, how many books is this supposed to be? 14? Time to go Bob for apples, right? Whoa! Okay, okay, here we go. So, this is part of my Mignola shelf. It is Abe Sapien, Dark and Terrible, Volume 1. So Abe Sapien, if you've watched the Hellboy movies, you know that he is one of the members of Hellboy's paranormal investigating team. He got spun out on his own to have his own series, which actually ran very similarly to Hellboy through a number of different miniseries that kind of also um, number on their own. Now, weirdly, even though this is Volume 1, it collects pa the paperback volumes of Abe Sapien 3 through 5. So the other ones are going to appear elsewhere. Uh, I've been really, really holding off on this because I wanted to have an all hardcover uh, Hellboy shelf, even though, again, get my injection for comparison. This is just a standard size hardcover. It's like, actually, actually, maybe it's a hair bigger. I don't know if it's as big as an oversized hardcover, but it's not as big as a library edition, that's for sure. Uh, so there's not oversized, but it's a really handy collection. And this is the way I prefer to have Hellboy stuff on my shelf. So uh, I'm happy to pick it up. And I think I'm like almost ready for my Hellboy read because so much stuff has come out to complete it this year. Oh, all right, I think that's the end. Wow, more Hellboy. Okay. Still waiting for that Hellboy in Hell, though. That'll be in my next haul. So let's see what we've got here. Uh-oh, we got tape stuck, stuck to a book. Emergency. Emergency. I. So here's a secret. If you're the kind of person who still puts your comics and backing boards on tape, or if even you put your books, you see I have some books in, in bags because I live in a, a moist environment here. It's a terrible word, moist, moist, moist. It's just a weird word. Um, I actually, you can get low tack tape. It's like a scrapping tape, but if you look for low stick or low tack tape, and if it gets stuck to the cover of a comic, it just peels right off and it's not tacky enough to take any of the print off of the comic. The bags don't stay closed as well, but you don't have that constant panic of like, oh my God, the tape stuck to my comic. This is Rick Remender's Deadly Class Volume 4. It isn't the newest volume, but it completes kind of the first 
first um, mega arc of the series, and I am still a little on the fence. I don't always, I turns out I loved Rick Remender writing on Kenny X-Force, but I haven't really connected with a lot of his uh, indie stuff, and so I thought if I'm going to read Deadly Class, I probably should read like kind of the first whole kind of mega arc story, and I heard from folks that that wraps up in this volume four, and I happen to have one through three because I'm a little bit of a zombie. Once I think I like an author, I just keep buying things and buying things from them, only to find out later, like, hey, maybe I don't like Rick Remender that much, but I guess I'll find out, because now I have four volumes of this. Can you tell I was planning as of the beginning of this year that we're going to go hard on some of these indie spotlights, because this is a lot of indie books and hardly any Marvel. Speaking of which, more Kelly Thompson. Wow. There's like t two, uh, it's Kelly Sue's, two Kelly Thompson's. This one I didn't like um, quite as much as some of the other stuff, but it's very funny. It's called Mega Princess. We do not use the word princess in this house. I do not believe in it. Um, anytime anybody calls my daughter a princess, she's been instructed from an early age to reply, is that some kind of programmer? Or I think you mean programmer, uh, which is the same thing I say, because princesses. Like, what is it even? Why should you aspire to be a princess? What is so special about them? So we don't do a whole lot of Disney, and we do not do the P word. But I made an exception for this one, because it was a princess as a superhero, and it's the idea that her fairy godmother is not the most uh, attentive or on-the-ball fairy godmother of all fairy godmothers. And so she arrived for the princess's birthday, and instead of doing something uh, specific to the princess, she's like, you can just have all the powers of all the princesses go wild. And so the princess winds up in a big mystery because of her kidnapped brother, and she's trying to figure out how to use all of the canonical princess powers. So think of, like, all the powers that every Disney princess or famous fictional princess has had. She can have all of them. So she can go under the sea and breathe. She can talk to the animals. She can shrink and grow tall. She can grow her hair really long. So it's kind of like a funny superhero story that's wrapped in something princessy. There's a couple of moments where it's, like, a little overly cynical or overly acerbic for me for the kid audience that's um, pointed towards. Maybe I'm just overly sensitive because I have such a little kid, and maybe, you know, eight-year-olds really like things that are this kind of, like, pointedly witty, but I, I mean, I was reading X-Men at age nine, so who knows. Uh, but it just felt like it was, uh, for how cutesy and princessy it was, it could have been like dialed down a little bit. But if we do an indie series spotlight on it, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more in depth. Two more here. So one of them is the Fantastic Four Masterworks number 19. Can you believe we're up to 19 in one of these Masterworks series? Here's what's so interesting about this one. This goes up to Fantastic Four number 218. So what is, um, I'm trying to find behind me where it is. I guess having all these toys on the shelf kind of makes it hard to take stuff out and, and compare it. But um, the first John Byrne omnibus actually covers some of these issues, but it has a gap because John Byrne left the title and came back and this pushes through that gap. So if we get a number 20, it'll finish up the gap and marry up on the other side to where the John Byrne Fantastic Four Omnibus has. In fact, I'm, I'm going to move the toys and uh, take it off the shelf because I actually want to confirm this for you while we we're speaking. So this has Fantastic Four 209 to 218. Uh, so I see I was a little bit wrong. Good thing I looked. And this says 204 to 218. So it completely is duplicated by this omnibus. And then the omnibus skips 219 and it skips from 222 to 231. So the hope is that the next masterworks would be from 219 to 231, which would then completely cover the gap that's in this omnibus. So this is kind of a weird buy because if you've got this, which is getting reprinted this year, you don't really need this. It's only got four issues at the beginning that aren't in this. So it's really the next one that's going to be really interesting uh, rather than this one. So let's get that back on the shelf. Excuse me, Aries. And we've only got one more book in here, but it's another kind of a big deal. It is another Magnolia verse book. See, the whole pattern of this has been like pairs. So this is Magnolia's uh, BPRD Hell on Earth. So you see directly behind me here, I actually have one, two, three, four uh, volumes of the BPRD Plague of Frogs, and then behind Jugs here, we have BPRD 1946 to 1948. So this is BPRD uh, Hell on Earth, which was a very long-running arc in this Hellboy companion book. And uh, this is the first time that it's in this hardcover format. Previously, it had just been in trades. And I will say, these, these hardcovers have a pretty nice build. They have a nice square spine. And let's see what the cover looks like underneath. Oh, and see, I like these library-style covers that are buckram with a debossed um, silver. 
So they're just a nice build quality. They're really not unreasonably expensive for the nice build quality. This retailed for $34. Mar Marvel releases like crappy, like six issue trades for $34. So to get this big hunk of book for $34, especially because you know if you get it at one of these discount comic retailers, it's gonna be like 30% off. Uh, it's totally good buy. And so my Magnolia shop, I'm gonna have to move some stuff, man, because I have these two new hardcovers and you'll see behind me, there's a gap for Hellboy and Hell, which should be in my next haul. So let me just make sure there's nothing else down here. That is it. That is all the books in this haul. So what am I the most excited to read from this? Because as you saw, a lot of them were things I'd either already read with my daughter, or they were like second volumes of things that I hadn't read even the first ones yet. I think I might be the most excited for more Kim and Kim. I really, I specifically abstained from reading the second one digitally because I love the first one so much I wanted to sit down and read both of them. Uh, so I think I'm the most excited out of this batch for Kim and Kim. So thanks so much for tuning in for this haul from In Stock Trades and uh, stay tuned for more videos about comics on this channel from Crushing Comics. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>